Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the 16th show. Pleased to say that we've been here for 16 weeks and we've got another show full of content from you guys. So the format is you send questions in and we try and answer them, all mountain bike tech related, of course. So make sure you send your questions in. The email address is on the screen as usual there and you can add them in the comments below or hit us up on Facebook. Just make sure if you're emailing in or using Facebook, use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. It makes us easy to find all those questions. So first up is from Reese Doing Stuff. Hi guys, I'm thinking about changing my old Cannondale to a single speed. I wanted to run a narrow wide chainring up front to help keep the chain in place for aggressive riding. Uh, what chain should I use? Would a single speed chain be too small for a narrow wide? Yeah, so typically a single speed chain will be wider than a normal 9, 10, 11 or 12 speed chain. And the whole effectiveness of a narrow wide chain ring relies on that narrow wide chain ring filling up the sort of void in between the chain links. So the chain can't rattle its way off. So by putting a traditional single speed chain on there, it may work, but it's probably not gonna work anywhere near as well. Now, the obvious thing to do is put a narrow wide chain, a conventional one, on your narrow wide chain ring. But if going single speed, quite often the rear sprockets don't fare too well. I mean, I'm sure there are several out there that do exist, and I did manage to find one from Absolute Black. They make one that's dedicated for use with a conventional chain and a narrow wide chain ring up front. So it's on the screen now, and there's a link to it in the description below this very video. So hopefully that is the answer for you. So get your regular chain, get your narrow wide chain ring, and get one of those sprockets or something close to it. Good luck. Next up from Adam Phillips. Uh, loving the tech channel, guys. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, I've been going through your drivetrain cleaning video, so that's the deep clean video. And I noticed this time around when trying to re remove my cassette, it was pretty difficult to do so. After a bit of banging, I got it off and I could see that the splines of the freewheel looked a bit worse for wear on the end where it did. Ah, right, okay, so I see exactly what you're talking about here. You've got a picture. So basically, on the cassette body, most cassette bodies are made of aluminium and as a result, certain types of cassette, they can actually cut in and cut a groove. And of course, when it comes to taking them off, they're gonna be stuck in that groove. And sometimes you have to tap those individual sprockets to help push them out. It tends to happen on the ones that you put the most amount of power through. So some of those smaller sprockets there. And it doesn't always happen. It does depend on the free hub body that you have. I can't see which particular brand that one you have. Uh, you say your cassette is a 1042 Sunrace and it comes off in multiple bits. So that is a prime example of how that happens. You get this with Shimano as well. Some cassettes have like a carrier and they slide on more or less in one hit with maybe two or three of the smaller sprockets that go on and then are held on by lock ring. The SRAM ones, obviously they're in one big lump to go on so you don't get that problem with those but some other cassettes of the Shimano pattern go on literally a sprocket, a spacer, a sprocket, a spacer, and they're the ones that can cut in. So there's a few ways around this. So what you can do in your case is you can file those out so they're at least smooth enough for your cassette to slide on. But of course the cassette will naturally click back into those sort of things. So you're not really gonna be able to do a proper repair job. I have heard of people gluing in bits of staples into those gaps and then just filing the ends off. So they're effectively metal filling in that gap. But the best bet is actually to get, after a while, is to get a new free hub body. Now there's a few brands on the market that make ones that have got a steel insert on them. So this particular one on screen now is by American Classic. It's an aftermarket product. You get these to suit various different hubs and it has a steel insert on that exact bit where the torque will be trying to rotate the cassette and damage it. So you might wonder why you can't just rotate the cassette round into the next set of splines. And it's because there's like a master spline. And the idea of that is A, it's easy to fit them all correctly and B, it ensures that the sprockets are orientated the correct way so the chain ramps line up so when the chain helps shifting up and down that block. So you can file those off like I recommended. That does help in the short term, but in the long term, you're gonna to need to get a new body on there. So next one, there wasn't a name written by it, it was just left in some comments. It says, what's the difference between dot fluid 4.1 and 5.1? Now dot fluid, as we know, is the alternative to mineral fluid, and dot fluid is Department of Transportation. So it's a certified fluid that has to be passed a lot of standards to be qualified as a 4.1 or a 5.1. Now the difference between those two is the 5.1 can hold a higher temperature, so it boils at a higher 
temperature, which is of course very important on motorized vehicles. Now I had to check out those temperatures online. I'm just looking at a chart here. Now you can get from dot three all the way up to 5.1, but I'll just look at dot four and 5.1. So dot four, a dry boiling point for that is 230 degrees. And then the wet boiling point is 155 degrees. That's both in Celsius. And the dot 5.1 is 270 degrees and 190 degrees. So it's just capable of holding a higher temperature, which of course on mountain bikes is probably not that much of an issue. Whereas of course in motorsports like motorbike racing, car racing, stuff like that, is the higher temperature is gonna be reached because brakes are used a lot more to slow down heavier things at higher speeds. If you wanna know a little bit more about dot fluids, that's the three, the 4.1, the five and the 5.1, if you click on the link that's in the description below this video, those guys over at Epic Bleed Solutions, it's a super helpful website, as well as having all the sort of syringes and the other stuff that you need to bleed your brakes, they've got some really good information on there, including that chart I just referred to that was on the screen a minute ago. Next up, hi Doddy, I'm in the market for a new mountain bike helmet as I had a crash yesterday and ended up in hospital. Which helmet would you recommend? I'm a trail rider and not doing anything insane. Um, kind of difficult to just recommend a helmet because it does depend on your budget, of course, and the shaped head that you might have. So all helmets, they're not the same, although they do have to pass standards to certify that they are safe for use. So personally, I would always say spend as much as you can afford on a helmet. Try not to buy the cheapest one out there. And if you do buy a cheaper helmet, make sure it's one from one of the bigger brands out there because they've done all of the really strict testing and they're most likely to have some sort of crash replacement policy. Some of them you have to sign up to, some of them will come standard with the helmets, which does mean that if you crash your helmet later on, there's a chance of getting another one cheaply to replace it. So always make sure that you do replace your helmet after you crash because they are designed to sort of compress to absorb that impact. Now I've literally, just today, I've still got the package on it, just taken delivery of my shiny new Park helmet here. So this one is a tactile race and it's the spin option which has got the new anti-rotational injury pads on the inside. Works in a similar way to some other options out there like MIPS that you might have seen. But a helmet like the Park is a high-end helmet and you're talking about well over £100 for that. But from my point of view, you know, you can't really put a price on safety, but I fully understand that some people just simply aren't going to spend that much on there. So in which case, I'm just going to throw you to a couple of helmets by Giro. So they've got a helmet called the Fixture, and they make this in a MIPS version, which has an anti-rotational thing similar to the POC, and they also make it in a non-MIPS. So the non-MIPS version retails for about 40 quid in the UK, so it's probably about $50 and the MIPS version is 55 quid, so anything around $70. And they're both excellent helmets. They've got peaks on them. They've got the cradle to keep your head into that helmet nicely. And they've got all the certifications you need for your type of riding. But just primarily above everything, make sure it fits your head correctly. And if you're unsure, get someone in the bike shop to help you get fitted for a helmet. Because regardless of the size you buy, if it doesn't fit your head correctly, it's not gonna do its job. And always make sure that strap is done up securely. Next up is from Shane Henderson. Let's talk about tubeless gunk. Another great video there, Doddy. I have a question about the tubeless sealant drying up. If it dries up over time, does it then leave uneven chunks of dry sealant on the inside of the tire? Could this affect the ride and handling of the bike? You guess what I'm really asking is, should the tire come off and old sealant be replaced rather than just adding more? Um, it kind of depends how often you're going to replace that sealant. If you're just topping up from time to time, it's quite likely that the sealant in there is still going to be in that liquid form, in which case, no, it's fine. If, like me, you take off tires for the summer and swap them around for the winter, you end up with loads of built up stuff in there that's got solidified. Really, you need to peel that out. So, the first reason to peel it out is it's actually going to stop the fresh sealant doing its job properly. So, the inside of that tire should be as clean as possible. Now, I wouldn't have said in most cases you're going to notice that rotational weight of having a blob of it dried up, but maybe on some really lightweight cross country tires, you would. I think given how light those tires, maybe it would make a difference. That's an interesting point. So, um, but my advice, yeah, if you're replacing your, your sealant completely, like a fresh load in, then just undo the tire and just have an inspect of that and make sure it's not got any of those big sort of bogeys of the stuff that dries up in the lumps. Because if it has solidified like that, it's not gonna 
fill up the holes in your tire because it's all congealed together. So peel it out if necessary, scrub it out, use what you have to. You can clean the inside of a tire using sort of stuff that evaporates, osopropyl alcohol, disc brake cleaner, that sort of stuff. Nothing too aggressive that's gonna damage the rubber though. So be careful with that and good luck. Next up from Eduardo Lorenzo. What is the app that Dotty uses to measure angles and stuff laid over the picture? There's quite a few available on the market. Uh, I'm sure there are for Androids. I've got an iPhone. Uh, the one I've got is called Angle Pro. It's a free app. Um, I'm not sure it's the best one out there. This one seems to work well enough if I centre this on the table. There you go, it seems to be pretty flat and I know that this table is flat. So there you go, Angle Pro is this one. I just searched for digital protractor or digital angle finder on the App Store and there's several available in there. Some of them have got a lot more features. Some you can put your phone down on a surface and it has like the bubble in the middle. So it depends how much you want to pay and what you need from it. But Angle Pro seems to do the trick. Uh, suspension related this time, this one's from Liam Ryan Streak. Hi Dolly, love your work. Quick question about suspension travel. Is it measured at sag or full extension? I have a 130 mil travel fork, but when I measured from the wiper to the top of the station, I measure 150 mil. Is that to counteract the 20 mil drop at 20% sag? Uh, yeah, you're kind of looking quite far into this. A 150 mil travel fork has 150 mil travel. When you set it up, you set the sag for the reason that you want the fork to have that breakaway force initially to work nicely, but also so it can dip into hollows and stuff in the ground. So you effectively lose 20 mil of that travel by sagging that, but you get it back because it works in the opposite way. So yeah, 150 mil fork has 150 mil travel, and then you put your 20 mil sag on it. Uh, I hope that clears that up. Okay, this is quite a specific question from Gwilym Howarth. What the best bikes in the 750 to 800 pound region must be a one by Shimano Hartel? Man, that's a bit of a lazy question. You could have done your homework if you're looking at it specifically. Look, I've had a look online. There are so many bikes out there. And to be honest, the best ones are gonna be the ones that are not one by specific out of the box because they're not spec that way. You can turn them into one by specific bikes yourself. But just for two examples, have a look at the Vitus Sentier. So it's a one by 10 Shimano deal bike with a sort of 130 mil fork, 27 and a half inch wheels. That's from Chain Reaction, I'm looking at this one, that's 850 quid. So it's a tiny bit outside your budget, but it's a really good looking bike to be fair. Uh, another one I spotted was the Trek Roscoe 7, that's 800 quid. Of course, Trek have got really good warranties, they're a massive brand, you're gonna be able to upgrade that bike easily. There are loads out there, but really mate, you need to spend a bit of time doing some homework, because you know, just like I just looked just then for 800 odd quid, I found those two. They're both good, but I certainly can't tell you what the best is because there's just so many bikes out there these days. But if you set yourself a target of a max 850, you're not going to get a bad bike. You can be able to find some really good stuff out there. Also worth considering, just off the top of my head, is the uh, Marin make a bike called the Nail Trail, and they do that in 27 half and 29, and that's one by actually, so that's worth looking at too. So there we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech in a bag. Hopefully you guys got your questions answered. If not, keep them coming in in those comments below and hit us up in all the usual avenues and we'll try and get your questions answered. For a couple more good videos, click down here if you wanna see a bunch of the GMBN Tech coverage from CL to Classic we were recently at. And click down here if you wanna see my video on the sort of the 29er downhill bikes we spotted there. As always, click on that big round globe to subscribe share us about, tell all your friends about us. We're well over 50,000 subscribers now and we wanna keep growing so we can give you better content. As always, if you like that video, give us a thumbs up.